Oh, decisions, decisions. What color do I want? Look, they left the pink one for me. Being invited to a great banquet. You know, uh, my wife uh, mentioned that uh, have you ever had a banquet that's been designed for you or a special event that's been set, focused around you and, and, and you're coming to be, to be a part of it and you're kind of the, 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 guest, the, the guest of honor? Um, my wife did that to me on my 55th birthday. She, uh, she had a surprise birthday and it surprised the snot out of me. Uh, send me, or can you say that? Sent me uh, off with my uh, with my kids to, uh, out for lunch. I couldn't figure out why my wife wasn't going to be there. Uh, but unbeknownst to me, uh, she had planned a birthday party that was totally in honor of me. And I, I don't. Has that ever happened to you? Has anybody had a, a birthday party or an anniversary that's been celebrated and it's, it's, a, it's been a big big gig, a big surprise? Yeah. A lot of us have. Uh, maybe some of us have. What does that say about you? Uh, no, I didn't. Just kidding. That was just a little joke. Um, one of the things that, that, that uh, I, I want to extend to you today is that we're, we're going to have a party here at the church. And, um, and I want you to know that we're inviting all of you to come to be a part of it because it's for you. Uh, on Monday, Thursday, we're going to have... Um, a, an evening of celebration, uh, and it's Christ that's going to ask you to come. And so on Monday, Thursday at uh, 6 o'clock, Cheryl, 6 o'clock, we're inviting all of you to come to a dinner that has been given in your honor. In fact, this next week you should be receiving an invitation in the mail uh, to invite you to be a part of that. You see, um, I believe with all my heart that uh, the, the one thing that we don't recognize enough in as, as, as followers of Jesus is to how important we are and how much God has prepared for us and planned for us a banquet. And so we're going to invite you to, to be uh, a part of that this next uh, Monday, Thursday. And if you don't get a card in the mail, that's because we screwed up. We want you all to come. And if you didn't get one, let us know. We'll make sure you get one. Because we want you all to be there. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about the passage that uh, was read uh, by Katie. Uh, a passage that talked about a, uh, a man who decided that, um, that he wanted to, to throw a party for his friends. And, uh, and so in, in that time, it, it, it was kind of one of those things where you, you sent out the invitations and you said, we're going to have a party. Didn't exactly give the, the right date or the date of the party because... That took time because they had to they had to kill the fatty calf, they had to uh, uh, create the bread and the meal and the feast, and and so uh, they put the word out and say, hey, I'm going to have a party and I'm going to invite all of you to show up and we'd love to have you come. And everything was right. The bread, the bread was baked. The, the the fatty calf had been roasted. Everything was ready for the, for the party members to come and. And so he sent his servants out and said, Hey, go tell the boys, the women, the families to come to our party. And uh, we read in Scripture that, uh, that when he went to tell them about the party, that there were all sorts of excuses why they couldn't come. You ever, you ever been uh, invited to an event? And that event... You know, well, it was okay, but it wasn't, you know, anything spectacular. But you were invited to an event, and you said, oh, yeah, I'll come. It'd be great. And then a day later, your best friend says, hey, guess what we're going to do on such and such a day? How about if we're, and all of a sudden, you have this invite. You've already said, I'm going to go to it. And then you come with this other invitation, and you go, oh, stay. Ever done that? I know you probably have never have, but I want you to know that I have. And, 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 it's, and it's kind of embarrassing because you have this opportunity to spend time with some, some of these people that you really want to spend time with, and all of a sudden you, and you have this other party and it's an obligation. What do you do? 
Or maybe you have planned a party. And you put the word out to say, Hey, I'm going to have a party and it's going to be this night and we want you to come and to be a part of that party and to celebrate with us. It happened to me once, or it's happened to me several times, but one in particular. I remember when I was a youth pastor in um, up in Duluth, uh, we had, um, uh, I was the first youth pastor this church had had for a long time, and so I'd come in and I was trying to build relationships with the kids, much like Josh is trying to do, is trying to build relationships with the kids. And, well, we had planned this huge party. It was, it had a rodeo theme. And that rodeo theme was, uh, we had made a bunking, uh, bucking bronco that you could actually buck on, and we had uh, goat roping, and, and we had all sorts of stuff planned. It was a huge thing. It was, and we had food, you know, big barbecue, everything was great. And so my wife and I, and our other youth workers, and, and a few of the young people, we had just spent hours preparing for this party. We had put the invitations out. We had told them it's coming. The night of the party, we were waiting with anticipation and excitement for them to show up, and nobody showed up. That ever happened to you? I think you can understand uh, the story as we read it about frustrations when you plan a party and nobody wants to come. Or I think that some of us can identify with being invited to a party and all of a sudden something better coming along and now what do you do? Well, these guys had excuses. I love these excuses. These are great excuses. You know, the first guy said, you know, I, I, I bought myself a house and I got to go check that baby out and make sure it was a good purchase. I'm thinking to myself, I bought myself a house and I jumped through a whole bunch of hoops before I even bought the house to make sure it was the house I wanted. By the way, I did find a few little flaws that were kind of bothering me. I got a leak somewhere in my wall and it goes into the basement. But that's beside the point. But I bought it, I checked it out, and, I was, and before I went and moved into the house, before I paid for the house, I had already checked it out. So, I'm wondering what was really going on with this guy that was going to check out uh, his house that he had already bought. It wasn't a very good excuse. But the second one, the second one's better. The second one is a, a big farmer who, uh, is Steve here this one? Uh, the second one is a big farmer who had, uh, who uh, in, in those days they didn't have trackers with the uh, uh, GPS on them. Uh, they had oxen. And they said, you know, I, I went out and I bought myself some oxen and they're beasts. And I, what I need to do is I can't come to the party. I got to go, hey, can you believe this? I got to go and check out my, my oxen to make sure that they know how to ox. Well, that's a good excuse. I mean, after all, if you're going to buy oxen and you're going to buy them to pull your plow and, and, to, and to take care of the ground, well, you've got to go check it out. Come on. I mean, do you ever buy a car without getting into it and driving it once? Or maybe some of you have. It would be like us saying, you know, I can't come to the party, I've got to go check out my new car. See if it runs well. Not too good excuse. Now, the only excuse that really had little legitimacy, the only excuse was the one that said, Hey, I just got married, and, you know, I just got to spend uh, time checking out under the hood, and uh, so I can't, I can't get there. And, you know, and that's a biblically legitimate excuse because in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, it says, For the first year of our can you believe this? For the first year of marriage, you are free from any and all obligations, and all you're supposed to do for the first year is hang out with your spouse. Can I see the hands of the people who spent their first full year of marriage just hanging out with their spouse? Can I just see the hands? What? Nobody? My wife and I did? Okay, that's not true. <laughs> so biblically, they had a foundation for being, having an excuse. That was the best of all three of the excuses. But here's the problem. It seems as we listen to the story that Jesus is saying that even though the Bible says that's true, that ain't any good excuse. As I, as I begin to look at the, the, the passage of Scripture and begin to think about, about um, 
why we do and say what we do and say, I, I begin to become challenged. I begin to become challenged at a lot of different levels. And one, one level is that if we believe by the way, I, I gotta I gotta disagree with my wife and her children, sir. Not that it's really really uh, a disagreement, but it's kind of a disagreement. She said that the story is telling about God reaching down to us. Well, really, it really wasn't a story about God reaching down to us, but it does have that application. But it, and it's challenging those the people of that culture to who are you inviting to your parties and why are you inviting him? And and, and so I, I, as I was thinking about the application about what Jesus, what Cheryl said about, you know, isn't that kind of true of us in our relationship to God? We get this relationship with God and, and, we, and we look and we begin to realize that that, that relationship with God is, well, it's, it's, it saves us. It gives us hope. We know where we're going to go when we die. We get all of those, and so it's, it's salvation is a huge part of, of that God coming down and inviting us to His party, and His party is heaven. I wonder. I wonder if sometimes we don't take that relationship with God too much for granted. I wonder if sometimes we don't get too comfortable with our relationship with God so that when God gives us an invitation, yeah, 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 I'll do it later. Nah, I can't do it today, God, I'll take care of it tomorrow. And we come up with excuses why we don't want to do or don't want to become involved, we don't want to be a part of, because we're comfortable. And we know that we're safe. And we know that we belong to God. So why do I have to get too uptight about getting it done, doing it when God asks me to do it? I'm really challenged with that as we as we look at our own our own lives and our own following of Christ. How seriously do we take that commitment to Christ? How invested are we in our faith? So that when God calls us, we are willing to respond and to go and to do what He calls us to do. Or how comfortable do we come in our faith? Then I thought uh, another challenge that came out of the text to me is um, Do you realize how much God loves you? I think it's a thing you've heard me talk about before, but I am convinced. That if we begin to understand how much we are loved by God, it would never be a problem to break away from whatever we're doing to spend time with God. Because we would know of what God has done for us and the value of that relationship to Him. And the challenge for me and the challenge for each one of us is to begin to explore and understand that God really loves us. He loves us. So much that He gave His whole life for us. That He lived amongst us, and the Scripture talks about Him. There's no place for Him to lay His head. The Scripture says that the the, the birds have nests to, to, to sleep in, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. That when Jesus lived on earth, He lived on earth not for His own benefit, not even for His Father's benefit. He lived on earth for our benefit, and even before He hit the cross. Everything he did was designed for us. He healed the sick. He touched the eyes of the blind. He invested in himself, in, in, in us, in every way that he possibly could. Now, how many of us take that seriously? How many of us live in the celebration of his love? Now, here's, here's where it gets interesting. The master went out and sent for friends to show up to the party. And, and, and the people that were his friends, the people that were a part of his life, they said, we can't make it. We can't make it. And I go, wait a minute, these are people that are friends. 
midst of people that are part of my life, these are people that I've invested in, why aren't they going to show up? And I can't help but believe it's because they didn't take the time to realize the sacrifice that the Master had done to make this meal for them. And they didn't care. And the challenge is for us to follow Christ. How often do we not invest ourselves or understand the love of God in a way that we understand the sacrifice He made so that we could go to this party? How seriously do we take that? The final thing that I want to mention. Isn't it interesting that when his buddies closed shop, he didn't come to the party, that the masters didn't shut down the shop. You know, when Cyril and I did that uh, radio, uh, rodeo thing, and nobody came, we just shut it down. And, uh, and we just kind of walked away going, oh. What would happen, would have happened with us if we would have not shut that party down, but we would have gone out into the neighborhood and found kids to come to our party, found adults to come to our party? What's so fascinating about this minister is he didn't stop by just giving an invite and then shutting down when all things were done. He went out and he found the derelicts of society. The drunks, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the mentally ill, the people with AIDS, the people who have lifestyles that are different than ours. He went out and found the, dis- the unlikables. He went out and found, as our last bishop said, he found the nuns, those who had no faith, those who had no relationship to him. He went out and found them and he said, come to my party. I want you to come to my party. The challenge of the passage of the scripture for me is how often are we content with inviting our friends to activities but we don't invite those who really would love to come. Sometimes faith becomes too convenient. Sometimes faith becomes too safe. Sometimes faith becomes too comfortable. And yet in this story, Jesus says, it's not, it's not a banquet for you who don't take me seriously. It's a banquet for all to come. It's a banquet for even the least of the least to come. When was the last time you missed out on going to a banquet that God has given to you and ignored his call? When was the last time you made an invitation for someone who didn't fit your expectations and your design? When was the last time that you recognize the gift of Christ that you died on the cross so that we might share that love to those around us. To our friends and family, yes. But to the least and the lowly, yes. Where is our faith lived out in our lives? It'd be easy, Father, to look and say, shame on these people for not doing enough. The problem is, Father, I have to stand in front of the mirror and have to say, you know, God, I don't take your love seriously enough. Father, I thank you that you don't keep track of my failures. But instead, you keep reaching out to me like you reached out to the derelict, the wounded, the hurting. Because, Father, that's really what I am. That's really what we are. 
may we recognize, Father, that we are the, the wounded and that God reaches out to us to invite us to his party. May we celebrate the gift of being invited to your party. Praise God. Amen. As we continue to work.